turn with me to the book of Psalms 119, Psalm 119. And um, again, I hope that y'all don't get uh, burnt out as going through this. And um, we are moving pretty good. I mean, I am in Psalm 119. I mean, come on, we, we've made some progress through the years. Amen. And uh, we done gone through 118 Psalms. So that's pretty good. We're in the 119th Psalm, and now we're in the third section of this psalm. And uh, we already looked at, uh, well, actually the fourth section, because we looked at the first, which is Olive, and then we looked at the Baith, and then we looked at Gimel. And that was the third section, third letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now we're in the fourth section, that's Daleth. And, uh, and uh, you, you see that above is probably D-A-L-E-T-H. If you got the word, and uh, if you don't, you'll have a funny-looking symbol up there, and that'll be the Hebrew letter, uh, Daleth, okay? And uh, so let's read this. Each section remembers eight verses. Each section in the Hebrew of this verse begins with the letter Daleth. It, it's, it's amazing how the poet did it. It's, it's, it's amazing. The Word of God is just amazing to me. Uh, and, and by the way, I want to reiterate, re, I don't think I need to reiterate it to anybody here, but it might be somebody that might listen to this broadcast at a later date might need to know it. But the Old Testament scriptures, Genesis, you know, through Malachi, are just as inspired as Matthew through Revelation. Okay? Now, all of it's the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. Amen? And, uh, and so... Uh, we got people out there that say, oh, you just, you just quote out of the Old Testament. And, of course, if I'd have quoted out of the New Testament, they said you left the Old Testament out. You know, it, like I said, it don't matter what. They're going to they gonna come up with some kind of excuse, right? These loose living, lying, lunatic, r crazy liberals, they'll come up with anything. Amen? And, uh, and so uh, let's read this section here, eight verses. It says, my soul, verse 25, my soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Now you might want to underline or highlight that word melteth. Kind of an interesting poetical word that's being used. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of the truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have struck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of the commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Now as we, I don't know about you, but sometimes it does better for me to hear it read sometimes by somebody else instead of me reading it. It does good about hearing it. Amen. That's the reason when you read the Word of God, it's good to read it out loud to yourself. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, something that will help you. The more senses that you can employ when you're studying, the better you will be. And so I learned that in college when I was uh, in my, uh, really in my second semester of college. I learned to talk to myself. And y'all say, oh, you probably did that before you went to school. Well, I, I did do a lot of it, and, and I do talk to myself, and I do answer myself. And sometimes I get so upset with myself, I won't answer myself for at least a week. So, uh, you know, so yeah, I'm bound to answer, ask, and to talk to myself, okay? And, uh, but when you're studying something, it's always good to read it out loud. And uh, that way, you know, you're, you're, you're reading it with your mouth and you're hearing it with your ear all at the same time, and it helps to understand it and, and, and hear it a little bit better, okay? And, uh, but it always does good. I, I, like, uh, I like Scorby. I don't know how many of you. Alexander Scorby. Uh, anybody familiar with Alexander Scorby? Okay, a couple of you. I like to hear him read the Word. I, I, I don't know. It's something about that, about his voice that just, I don't know, brings reverence to the Scriptures. I, I, don't, I don't know. It just, to me it does. 
And uh, so I like to listen to him read it. And sometimes I'm going, if I know I'm going to be in the car for a little while, I'll turn the thing on and I'll just listen. And that, 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 that's a good way of doing it, going down the road. Amen. And uh, so another, another idea, okay, another idea. But uh, th again, this is Dolith. And I've given this uh, sort of two subtitles. One, gleam, gleams amid gloom. Gleams amid gloom. And uh, if you want to alliterate. And then here's one more practical. His words strengthen the weak. His words strengthen the weak. How many of you in here have been weak at times spiritually and need an uplift, right? Uh, we all do, amen? And, uh, and so that's the way that it is. And uh, so I wrote down, and I want to give you these, and uh, then we're going to get into the outline of, the, of, of these eight verses here uh, quickly. But I want to give you uh, ten observations that I have gotten from these, this, this, these eight verses, Okay. Number one, what are we, in other words, when you look at these eight verses, what are we learning? Okay, what are we learning? Here are the ten things that I came up with as far as observations. Number one, my soul cleaves to the dust. That's the first phrase. And uh, it cleaves to the dust. And, uh, and so I, I, I thought that, you know, when I think of cleaving and I think of dust, I think of dry, dryness, don't you? I do. And, uh, and then that brings me to the second observation. Well, when that happens, the Lord, His Word revives me. Okay? His Word revives. Number three, when I confess my sins, He forgives. When I confess my sins, He forgives. The Bible tells us in 1 John that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what He says. Then, number four, he teaches his statutes until I understand them so that I will meditate on them. Remember what the psalmist wrote, Psalm, Psalm 2, when he says, Upon thy law doth I meditate both day and night. All right? But he teaches me his statutes until I understand them so that I will meditate on them. Day, so I will meditate on them. Number five, my sin brings me grief but His Word strengthens me. Sin will bring grief. His Word strengthens. All right? And then number six, the false way is already a, pa a part of who I am. We're sinners saved by grace, so the false way is already part of who I am. But when you're saved, you get a divine nature, and now that's part of who you are as well. Okay. Number seven, any understanding that I have of His law or ability to follow His law comes from Him. All spiritual ability comes from the Lord. Amen. From whence cometh our help? Our help cometh from the Lord. Okay. Bible. Number seven, or number eight, living faithfully is a choice. And it is accomplished by keeping His Word before me. Now that doesn't mean that i got to remember it in my brain and memorize it. I just keep His Word before me. I need to read it day in, day night, morning and evening. The, the psalmist wrote in another location, morning and evening do I read thy word. You know, a lot of people say, well, I get up in the morning and read the Bible. Well, that's a good time to read it because you're clear. Why don't you read it at night too? Amen? Be a good time. Begin and end your day with the Word of God. Number eight, following His testimonies keeps me from shame. Following His testimonies keeps me free from shame. And, uh, and then number ten, I can enthusiastically obey His commandments because He enlarges my heart. And we're going to talk about that when we get there in verse uh, 32. Okay? And uh, so as we read this psalm, I think it's, in, I think it's uh, you know, right to say that the psalmist is overtaken in some kind of grief. He's grieved in this section of the psalm. He says, because my soul cleaveth unto the dust. 
but he quickened thou, quickened thou me according to thy word. So right off the bat, the psalmist is, 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 is telling us that he's in some kind of grief. And so grief has set in. And, and, and you might want to write this down. This, this, psalm, this part of, of Psalm 119 is the first of nine prayers of, the, of this psalm. There are nine prayers in, these, in the Psalm 119. This is one of the nine, the first of the nine. And, uh, and he's praying basically for the quickening of the Lord. Now, you and I, when we got saved, the Bible tells us, and you might want to write this down in the margin of your Bible there. And again, that's how I do it because, you know, it just makes sense to me. Uh, you know, that way I don't, if I, don't, if I forget it, I, I can see it right there. Then I can connect it to the verse in the Old Testament. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, what did Paul write? Paul says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we are had our conversation in times past, and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, as we read that passage, we understand that there are times in our lives that we're grieved, well, because of several things, regardless of the sin of others, sin of ourselves, or whatever the case may be, we're in a grieved state. So, regardless of what that brought on that grief. Our soul, or our, our, see, the psalmist puts it, cleaveth unto the dust. And we ask for quickening. But the Bible says, and you hath he quickened. That word quickened in the New Testament means to make alive. It means, to, you know, it's like taking the point, you know, you who were once dead in trespasses and sins, Paul talks about in another section. And then, and you hath he quickened. In other words, made alive. When you got saved, God raised you from the spiritual of dead. Amen? Y'all realize that. When you got saved, you were dead spiritually, and God raised you miraculously spiritually. And uh, so now you are alive. You have been quickened together with Christ. And that's what the psalmist here is praying for in the Old Testament. Lord, quicken me. And how is he going to do that? Through his word. You and I get depressed. You and I get despondent. You and I get you know, uh, you know, out of our sort sometimes. And we need an encouragement. Where are you going to get it? Go to the Lord. Go to the Word of God. It will encourage you. By the way, I want to thank all of y'all who have flooded Facebook with, with, with verses. Now, hadn't that been a blessing? I mean, have you seen all the verses? I mean, you know, I, I started off just sharing all over the place. Now, I backed off a little bit. Now, some of y'all just picked it up and going on with it. I, I see verses all the time, and I, and I like it. Instead of listening to this ugly stuff up there, I get out and see Bible verses all the time. It's, it's refreshing. And, uh, and you know other people are seeing that too, amen? And, that, and, that, and that's a blessing. I share them all. When I get to them, I share them. <laughs> so I just share others what they're, what they're doing. But how's the psalmist wanting to be quickened? Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. And uh, so the, psalm, the psalmist is finding uh, comfort in three things I wrote down. Number one, he, wrote, he, he, he finds comfort in the God that's still on the throne. He's still in charge. And that's something you and I have got to remember. I heard somebody say it today, and I corrected it. I heard somebody say today, well, you know the election's coming up, and, you know, and they said it this way. If Trump don't get elected, we are, we, we're doomed. I said, no, we're not. I said, if anything, we're doomed anyway. I said, it don't matter who gets elected. You can look at it, we're doomed anyway. I said, but just remember one thing. And this is what I told the person. I said, just remember one thing. Don't ever forget it. God's still on the throne. And God's still in charge. And God's got a plan. And God's going to work His plan. We're part of the plan. Let's get with the plan. You know what part of the plan we've got? We need to tell everybody about Jesus Christ that we can and do everything we can with what we have while we can. Amen. That's, what, that's, that's the part of the plan we've got. So let's get busy doing it. Amen. So, you know, we're not doomed. I, I, I find encouragement in the fact that God's still on the throne. 
I find encouragement in the fact that he's still mighty to save. That's number two. God, that he's still mighty to save, that God's still in the saving business. He still will save somebody regardless of who they are, what they look like, where they come from, what they have, what they don't have, who the mom and daddy is, who the mom and daddy's not. It don't matter. God is mighty to save. And, uh, and, 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 you know, and I find comfort in that too. As well as number three, that the so God, sovereign, uh, our sovereign God is over every situation and circumstance of life. These hurricanes that have come through. Now, I can tell you this. Now, do I think God caused that hurricane to go up and do that? No. But there's one thing for fact. God didn't stop it. That's a fact. I said that very thing on September the 11th when, when those planes flew into the building. I heard people say, well, God caused that. I said, you don't know that. I said, but I'll tell you this. God could have, God didn't stop it, and He could have. God could stop that hurricane. God could stop a tornado. But you know, sometimes God allows things to happen to reach people who before something happened were not reachable. You know what I mean? Let me tell you something. I told you all about a church up there, Trinity Baptist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. Very familiar with that church. Been there many, many times. I knew the pastor prior to this one. I knew him very, very well, Dr. Ralph Sexton. I know him very, very well. And, uh, and, and, you know, that church, I don't know who in the world in that church, what gave that church the idea, but they went out in the parking lot and drilled two wells. <coughs> two wells. Big church. I'm sure you've been there, Miss Deborah. Uh, it's, two, it's, 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 it's a big church. And, uh, but they've been really affected by this hurricane. But they went out in the parking lot and drilled two wells, then went and had the water tested, and it was pure mountain spring water. And they're telling everybody in the community, look, you bring your drinking vessels by here and fill them up anytime you want to. Ain't that a blessing? Amen. Let me tell you something. When, when all this is over and things get back to normalcy, there's going to be people sitting in the pews of that church right there that wouldn't even think about going to that church prior to this hurricane. All because they put water in the parking lot. Think about it. God used a well. Amen? Amen. God used it well. And uh, so God, God's sovereign over all circumstances and all situations, regardless of what, they, what, what those situations are. So let's look at this psalm in two ways, okay? Number one, what the psalmist realized. In the first, you know, f four verses of this psalm, God's Word has the answer to every need and, he, and this psalmist applies the Word of God in five fundamental ways in these verses. And let me give you those ways real quick. Number one, he applies the Word of God in conviction. In verse 25, remember he says, My soul cleaveth unto me, quicken thou me according to thy word. The Word of God is what brings conviction, right? The Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us in John 16 verse 8, comes to do what? He comes to convict of sin, convict of righteousness, and judgment to come. So he's going to convict of those things. So the Word of God, is, it, it, you know, he's using the Word of God in, in, in his life in conviction. Number two, it's in confession. In confession. Look at verse 26. The Bible says, I have declared my ways. And he says, and thou heardest me, teach me thy statutes. I have declared my ways. You've got this liberal bunch of young theological wimps coming out of the seminary that say, well, you know, you know, the Lord's Prayer wasn't one of those things that's been around since the, you know, since the evangelicals in the early 19th century. And, uh, and, and back in the day, it wasn't there. And, you know, nobody said you got to say a sinner's prayer and get saved. Well, I don't, I, I tell people like this. You may not have to say the sinner's prayer, but you got to say something. <laughs> Bible says, For with the mouth, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You got to say something. And I, I find the best thing to do is to tell the Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, low, good, good for nothing sinner and deserve hell, and I want you to forgive me and come into my heart and save me. That's declaring my ways before the Lord and asking Him to save me. That, that's, in, that's in confession. 
I ain't going to get no school boy. I, I call them school, you know, schoolyard arguments with these little theological wimps coming out of seminary. That's what I call them. I tell them that. Don't bother me. I don't have a problem. People dying and going to hell, you over here arguing about whether or not the Lord's Prayer is good or not. When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord, buddy? Calvinists, they don't, because everybody's got been elected anyhow, so it don't matter. Better get out there and tell somebody. That's the reason the Lord told us to go out there and tell them, because He said you need to go tell them so the Holy Spirit can convict them so they can come to the Lord. That's, that's, that's what it's about. So he said he used it in fundamental ways. Number one, in conviction. Number two, in confession. Number three, in consecration. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, Make me to understand thy way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. In other words, help me follow thy precepts. That when the Word of God comes in our life, and it changes the way we talk, changes the way we act, changes the places we go, changes the things we do, changes the way we dress. It changes the way of everything in our life because of the precepts of God's Word. And then number four, in contrition. Look at verse 28. My soul melteth for heaviness. And I'm going to stop right there because I told you to highlight that word. You know what that word melteth means? It's equivalent to the word weeping. In other words, you're melting. He's using the, the poetical term of melt. But he's, he's really talking about weeping. He's talking about my soul weepeth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me. According to thy word, Jesus wept for our sins. Jesus wept at Bethany because of what sin had done to Lazarus. And he was weeping because of what he was going to call Lazarus back from and back to. He was weeping because of that. He wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. He was weeping because of what sin had done. Amen? And then he weeped over Jerusalem and told Jerusalem how he would have drawn them unto himself, but yet they would not come. Then he weeped in the Garden of Gethsemane in contrition. And then number five, in contrast, verse 29, Remove from me the way of lying and grant me the law graciously. Thy word stands in contrast to the way of lying. The Word of God. The Word of God is what? Truth, right? The Bible's truth. John 17, verse 17, when Jesus was praying for His disciples, He says, Father, sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. The Word of God stands in stark contrast with that of lying. So that's, that's five things that the psalmist realized. Let's close this psalm out in verses 30, 31, and 32 with what the psalmist resolved. As a result of the, th- as a, as a result of the things he realized, what did he, what would, did he, what did he finally resolve? He made three resolutions, the psalmist did. Number one, he made a resolution, a decision to live for God. In verse 30, look at verse 30. The Bible says, I have chosen the way of truth. Amen? I've chosen to live for God. I've chosen to follow thy word. I've chosen to follow the truth. It's a choice. It's a resolution that we make. And uh, I think it's like Daniel. You know, Daniel, when he was carried away into captivity, the Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the luxury of Babylon at the king's table. Amen. You and I live in a foreign land and we need to purpose in our heart that we're not going to defile ourselves with the, with the defilement of this world. We need to live for God. And, uh, and you know, and, and, and Daniel, you know, he had, he had paths that he could have took. But instead, instead of the path of promotion, he took the other path to peril. Instead of the path of delight, he took the path of danger. Instead of the path of the world, he took the path of the Word of God. He trusted. What God said. Same thing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They trusted the Word of God. 
So they decide, he, this, this psalmist decided to live for the Lord. The second resolution that this psalmist did is found in verse 31. He says, I have stuck. I like that. I say I like. Must have been a southerner that wrote this. Must have been a southern psalmist. He said, he says, I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. In other words, not only did he decide to live for God, he was determined. He was determined that he was going to live for God. And in in other words, you have the crisis in in the first section. Okay, here's the crisis. I'm going to live for God. Here's the process. I'm going to determine to do it. And I'm going to stay glued to the book. That's how I put that word stuck. He said, I have stuck under thy testimony. In other words, I'm glued to it. I'm stuck to it. That's all I know. That's all I can get. That's all I can do because I'm stuck to it. I can't get away from it. Don't want to. Amen. And that's the way Christians today ought to be is glued to the book. All right. So he decided to follow, to live for the Lord. He determined to live for the Lord. And then, and then thirdly, his desire to live for the Lord. What, if you make a decision, you can make a decision all day long. You can determine to do it, but you better have some desire because if you don't, it'd be hard to do it. Okay? You know, I tell you what, when I got saved, God saved my want-tos. Amen? I don't have a problem putting these things of the world aside that, you know, that, 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 you know all this stuff the world does because I want to. Amen? God saved, when I got saved, God saved my want to. And uh, but a desire to live for God, I mean, and, and, and that's in verse thirty-two. I will run the way of Thy commandments when Thou shalt enlarge my heart. Now, if you are going to have an enlarged horizon, then you're going to have to have an enlarged heart. You're going to have to have an enlarged heart. You know, one of the things that we as Christians need to pray for, you hear it from missionaries all the time. What we see with our eyes affects our hearts. I've said many times as a pastor, if I could pick up Westside Baptist Church as a whole and put you down in any mission field that I've ever been on, I don't care if it's Mexico, I don't care if it's Montana. I don't care if it's Alaska. I don't care if it's India. If I could pick this church up and set it down in the midst of that mission field for one week and let you see what God is doing in other places and bring you back and set you back down in the place where we are right now, things would be totally different than what they are right now. Because the seeing with our eyes Affects our hearts. That's the reason you say, well, these preachers, man, they, they, that's the reason these missionaries, you see them up there weeping, crying over those people, and you say, why? Wow, they've been there. They've seen it. That's what you see with me because I've been there and done it. I remember when I was in mission conferences at Highland Park Baptist Church during college, I wanted to go to every mission field that came through. And they say, oh, that, that, he's to the India. I want to go. Well, he's to India. I want to go. Well, he's to Zion. I want to go. I wanted to go to all of them. And I still want to go to all of them. I, I, I mean, I, I go to India. I, I try to look, find a way back. I want to go back. I mean, I, I want to stay. I mean, why leave? I mean, let's stay here and do it. I mean, you go out there. Yeah, look, it ain't like America. You got to beg, plead, and pay. And I believe if you paid some Americans, they wouldn't come. And, uh, you, you know, you, you go to America, people don't come. Go to India, say they're going to be a guy preaching down there. 200, 300 people show up. And you go down there and preach. You preach the gospel, people get saved. I mean, you go out there in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere, put up a bamboo uh, 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 structure out there, and it's a church, and people come. It's amazing. In America, you heat, cool it, put comfortable pews in there, do, and do everything out, and you can't pay them to come. Your eyes affect your heart. And we ought to all pray that God will enlarge our hearts. And say, Lord, just enlarge my heart. 
The Word of God strengthens the weak. You know, at the, at the risk of being redundant, if we want to go fast, we can go all by ourselves. If we want to go far, we do it together. We can do a whole lot together. And we're doing it, but we can do a lot more. And I just want to, we just need to keep on keeping on doing what we're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ till Jesus comes. You say, preacher, how long are we going to do this? Till Jesus comes. When he calls us, we know it's time to go to the house. You know, I think about that back when I was a kid. used to run around the neighborhood barefooted in shorts. And man, I got into my playing too. I was, man, I had dirt rings around my neck. You know, I was sweaty, dirty. Mama wouldn't let you in the house until it was time to come in. And then she'd come to the door and it was dusk. She'd say, she'd holler, you're here. It's time to get in here. It's time to come home. And you better come. She had to call you more than two or three times. Then she's coming to look for you. That ain't ever no good. But that ain't the way it's going to be with the Lord. When he calls us, he's going to say, it's time, come on. It's time. We're going to go out there and get washed up and sit down for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Boy, what a time it's going to be. What a time it's going to be. Man, just think. But in the meantime, let's get into our work. Get them dirt rings around our neck and our arms and legs. And get into the work God given to us to do until he comes out to the door and says it's time to go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for again being here tonight. What a privilege, Lord, to hold your word in our hands, to read it, study it. What a privilege it is to be able to pray to a holy God. Lord, we thank you so much for putting up with us. Lord, we're just sinners, but we're forgiven through your shed blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for it. Lord, for without it, we'd be lost and undone with no hope in this world. Help us to go out and to be a light in a dark world, be salt in a decaying, and tasteless world. May we do our part. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Pray for Brother Casey and whoever's going with him on Friday.